Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I hope all of you are okay. Um, the hike yesterday was really cold. I think there's still one or two people missing from yesterday. I hope, nevertheless, they're okay and that we see them later. Yeah, the, at least that's for sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody made it back. Yeah. And every hotel should have a hot shower, so, yeah. So in this first lecture, we will talk a little bit about the existence theory. Um, so as you know, in general, like an equation, for example, could have an exist, like could have solutions, but it could also have not have solutions. And in fact, the case for causal fermion systems, we know that there are, um, I mean, there exist causal fermion systems which satisfy the constraints and for which the action has a finite value volume. Now, this is for sure. And the question which we want to ask in this lecture is basically whether there, whether we can prove, or I will show you how one can prove that minimizers of the causal actions with the constraints actually exist. And maybe just for those people who are not mathematicians, just a very a, a short illustration. So if you think about this sort of being the space of causal fermion systems, so um, what we will do basically, we will look um, at a sequence of causal fermion systems, um, which makes the action smaller and smaller. And the fundamental question is basically whether if we take such a sequence of causal fermion systems, whether the limit of the sequence is in the space of causal fermion systems, as we have defined them, or, the whether, or whether it's not. It could be that basically by considering a sequence which makes the action smaller and smaller, you end up just sitting, if this like supposes were an open set, you're sitting, you end up sitting on the boundary. The boundary. And this of course depends on, the uh, depends on the topology, and I will explain in detail um, how one proceeds to actually show that also the limit is in the space of causal fermion systems, if you like. So the first part of the talk is called the direct method, because this is what one uses, the direct method of um, the calculus of variations. So an S, the name is a chest, so this basically means that um, the way to prove the existence of minimizers in the case where the, vo the volume is finite and in the case where H is finite dimensional is um, quite straightforward. So there are just uh, some technicalities one has to address. So how does the direct method of calculus of variations uh, work? So basically there's three steps. So the first step in proving the existence of minimizer is basically that one shows that the action is bounded from below. And in fact, um, we know that the Lagrangian is a positive number, so it follow and the measure is positive as well, so it follows immediately that this is the case. But I will write this down again um, for the application part in a minute. And so if you have shown that the action is bounded from below, it follows immediately um, that there exists a sequence And I will now only write down rho n. So for now, we'll just fix the dimension of the Hilbert space, and um, we fix the spin dimension. So those, this part h and this part f of the causal fermion system is fixed for now. We can talk about um, how to, like, why this is not a, why this holds without loss of generality um, later. So there's a sequence of measures on f, um, such that the following is the case such that basically the action of rho n converges to the infimum of all rho tilde as of rho tilde, okay? So we know the action is for bounded from below, so we know this exists, and then we know there's a sequence such that it converges, like the, the value of the action converges. However, we do not yet know whether the sequence itself converges in the space which we, which we take into account. Um, and so this is basically the second part of the direct method, so the second part is um, show that the sequence rho n has a convergent subsequence <coughs> A 
and I should say in some topology tau, and this is like the, in German you would say the crux, I don't know if it's an English word, that's like the, 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 the central point in some topology tau. So the question is in which topology? And then the third part, so once you've done this, the third part is to show that the action is at least lower semi-continuous with respect to this topology. So maybe I should say sequentially, <coughs> lower semi with respect to the, the topology. So why does this show that there actually um, is a minimizer? Um, well, this is the case because from two and three, the following thing follows. Yeah? Oh, so, sorry, I don't know why I wrote three here. It's supposed to be S. Yeah, sorry, it's still early. Um, okay, and then let's just, um, uh, so maybe, sh um, <coughs> so denoting the limit of the subsequence and I will denote the subsequence like this. So this will just be row n and then I'm just putting an m here. Okay, so this means you choose a subsequence of the sequence, and then we'll have an M here, or, a, or M, yeah, let's put M here. And we denote the limit of the subsequence by row zero. So this means that we actually have row and M converges to row zero in the topology tau. Um, two and three imply um, the following line of reasoning. So first of all, while well, we know the infimum over all measures rho, as of rho tilde, well, this is the same thing as the limit of the sequence, just because this was the first step, because the action is bounded from below, and we choose the sequence like this. So this would be the limit of n, I mean, n goes to infinity, as of rho n. But now we know the subsequence, so it's a subsequence, so this is still the same, so I can just write it like this. So this is the limit over, maybe I should write nm, and then I will just write it here, so the subsequence, okay? But now um, we know that the action is lower semi-continuous, so this is basically lower semi-continuous, um, and from this it follows, so that's basically the definition of lower semi-continuity, or this is directly implied by the definition of lower semi-continuity, that I can actually pull the limit inside and the limiting point has a smaller value. So this means, so this is just a limit, still over all nm, but now I'm just writing basically, uh, sorry, sorry. This is just the action and I've put the limit inside and I'm going, just gonna write row zero here because this is what we chose to denote the limit. And then, since this is just a measure in, so it converges in the space we consider, well, this is just larger and equal than the infimum of all rho tilde, S of rho tilde, um, and this is by definition of, you like, by definition of infimum, yeah? So this is just true for all measures. And so what you see is, that the infimum is larger than this value, and this value is larger than the infimum, or larger and equal. So from this it follows directly that um, S of rho zero is equal to the infimum over all rho tilde, S of rho tilde. And this means that the minimum is attained.
So in other words, we have chosen a topology in this procedure, or this is like once we have shown those three steps, we have chosen a topology so that the actual minimizer is really still inside the set. So it could be, like it could be on the boundary, but it could also be somewhere else. So this is what basically we have done. And this is called the direct method of calculus of variations. And it's very well known and it, I mean, yeah, so it's, it's just like it's nothing special. And the thing we will talk about in this lecture um, is basically how to apply this to causal fermion systems. So this is the second part of the lecture, application to CFS. Are there any questions up to this point? So we don't even have a complex structure in the space of measures, at least not directly. Not yeah. Yeah. So why would you have yeah. Yeah. So um, like, it, hmm. I don't. So yeah. So I don't. So I don't know if we can. Like, in, so it depends on the topology, whether the action really blows up at the boundary. Maybe I can say it like this. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So it's in this, if I, yeah, yeah. So it's at least supposed to be in the second link. I don't know, is it there already? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so we sent you two links and it's the second link. The one which is not finished and which is very preliminary. But this part is actually written up quite nicely by Felix. Ah, yeah. Okay, so this is the application to causal Fermi system. So, okay, as I said, if we consider the first point, so we know that um, the Lagrangian is a function to the positive or non-negative real numbers, and from this it follows immediately this S of rho is an element of the positive or non-negative real numbers. Yeah, usually write it like this, plus um, for all rho, okay? Let me just write it like this. Um, and this, is, this means that the action is bounded from below. Okay, so this is good because this means the first point is done already. Um, and now we'll talk about the second point. Also, um, so maybe I just write it like this, add two. And I will have to recall some things. Um, so, so the first step will be to recall the banach alaruglu theorem. So um, for now we'll just denote, e, um, we just choose the letter E and some norm with respect to E and we let this be a banach space be a separable Banach space. So this means just, so we have a space, we have a norm on it, a vector space, a norm on it, and this space is complete for all of you who are mathematicians. So this is a separable Banach space. And um, we denote its dual by just putting a star on this. So let me just write this down. So E star, and the norm now has an index E star here, <coughs> be its dual. And so here this, um, like the norm on a dual space is actually the supremum norm. That is, so phi, just to recap, phi in E star is a mapping or a linear mapping, I should have said, linear mapping phi, which takes E to the real numbers in this case, or is it actually, yeah. Um, and, um, and this is continuous. This is just the definition of dual. 
And this norm which we have here for the dual space is just the supremum norm. So phi E star um, is just given as um, the supremum over all U in E. And this is important, or I mean, yeah, so for which the norm in E is one. So we just look for the supremum over all vectors in E, which have norm one. Um, and then I take the absolute value of phi applied to U, okay? So this is just the norm on that. <clears throat> and we will apply these two measures in a minute. Let me know if there's any question, if anything is unclear. So this is just a dual space, typical notion in mathematics. And last but not least, we know that we need a notion of convergence, and this will be the notion of convergence which we, corresponding topology, will be the topology for the second step here. And so we'll define this like this, basically, maybe definition, a sequence, And now we'll have phi n. So for me, um, yeah, so my phi and my empty set look similar. So I will tell you whenever there's an empty set. So this is supposed to be a phi here. So a sequence phi n, where n so in, the, uh, in the natural numbers. And this is supposed to be a sequence in E star. So it's supposed to be points of E star. And those are linear functionals on E. So, uh, and this is... Um, and the term now is weak star convergent. Um, to some phi in E star. Let me just highlight this because this is the notion which I'm defining. So this is weak star convergent. If the following is true, if the limit of n going to infinity. And now <clears throat> what I'm doing is I'm applying phi n to u. And for every u, this is supposed to be the same as phi of u. If this holds um, for all u in E. OK, that's just the definition. And we'll see in a moment that this is really the, con the right, like if you apply this whole thing to measures, this is really the sort of convergence for measures which makes sense or which is like intuitive maybe. Um, e star, E star? No, uh, sorry, I said this is supposed to be like as a set, a subset, yeah. Every single one of them is in E star. Yeah. Yeah. You could also say it's a tuple, yes, yeah, it's true. Yeah, like, notationally, I agree. So it's just like it's a bit, I wanted to save some letters, but I could have just written it because now we wasted the time anyway, so. Yeah, but so what I mean by this is every phi n is an element of E star, and then we have a, an infinite tuple of elements of E star, exactly, yeah. Okay, and so with this notion of convergence, um, there's this very famous, banach uglu theorem, and it's very brief, and I'll just write it down. <clears throat> every bounded sequence, like this, every bounded and here bounded means bounded from above, uniformly, sequence in E star has a weak star convergent subsequence. Okay, so this is nice because now we already, so that we have a handle now on the second point. So what we're doing here in the first point is we take a sequence in the second point, we want to have a subsequence. So now this theorem sort of gives us a subsequence. It still requires it to be bounded. So the next step will be to apply um, this setup here, Banach spaces and weak convergence um, to measures. So let's just write this. We apply, um, <coughs> we apply this to Banach space of 
continuous functionals. <coughs> functionals. OK, so what does it mean? Now we're already in this. Uh <coughs> Okay, so we apply this to the Banach space of continuous functionals. So what this means is basically that we choose <coughs> E, the Banach space. So this just as the continuous theorem here means continuous, yeah? The continuous functions of some space, and I'll tell you which one this is in a minute. Um, the real functions. And we'll just choose the norm of so if we choose an f in this, we, we define the norm on f with respect to E just as the supremum over x in k, um, the absolute value f of x. OK, so that's what we do. And for this setup, and that's the point, if this here is a compact topological space, for this setup, we have the Ries-Markov theorem, which connects what we just did to measures. So I'll write that down, and there will, in the theorem, we'll also space specify k. So maybe let me write it, like, write it like this. So theorem, and this is exactly the theorem which, you, which Andreas has shown you in the first lecture on Monday. But I will just recap it, because people have by now probably forgotten it. So let k be a compact. topological space. <coughs> and here this compact is important and unfortunate because otherwise we would be done in five minutes. But it's just, this just holds for compact spaces. Um, and then we just um, choose, so let lambda in E star. So that is now the dual of this space. So those are all linear continuous functionals on this space. Be uh, continuous, so I'm just writing this again. Continuous linear functional <coughs> um, which is positive and I'm just, which is positive and I'm just going to say what this means to be positive. So this just means that is <coughs> lambda applied to one of those functions um, is bigger or equal than zero for all non-negative functions. F in C0 of K to R, or E, I could have written in. Okay, so if this is the case, so this just defines what positivity is, then um, there, there exists um, a unique regular positive, not necessary to mention, or maybe I'll write it down. We always, my measure is always positive. Positive Borel measure. on K such that the following holds, and this is now the central part, basically. <coughs> such that this lambda of F can be written as just the integration of the function F with the measure mu. Did I give it a name? 
regular Bray measure, so this measure is supposed to call, be called mu. Okay, the measure is called mu on k, such that this function here is really just given by the integration. So if you like, you can also write an x here. If you're more familiar with that, you write an x here. And this is supposed to hold um, for all f in E. Okay, so this is basically the statement of the theorem. So um, just to summarize, so what the theorem does, it tells us, well, if we have a positive linear functional, that's just the same as a, as a measure in this setting. And in fact, the other way holds as well. So if you're given a measure, then of course, integrating a function gives you a real number. And it turns out that this really is a positive linear measure. Uh, this is a positive continuous functional. So this goes in both ways. One of them is sort of direct, and the other one is given by this theorem. And I should maybe have said this is um, the Ries representation theorem, but Andreas said that. And now what we can do, we can now combine those two results we have. So here we know, okay, if we have a bounded sequence in E star, then it has a convergent subsequence. And this basically tells us, well, as long as those, the sequence consists of positive functionals, there each single one of them is given by a measure. And so this tells us basically if we have um, a bounded sequence of measures, then there's a convergent subsequence in this topology. And I'll write down what this topology is in this setting in a minute. And it turns out this is just convergence of measures. So let me write that down and then we'll take some time to think about it. Um, okay, so this is the end. So what we do now, we combine both theorems. And we'll get a new theorem. <clears throat> so the theorem is as follows, and then we'll just pause for a second and think about what we have done so far. So let, and now let me write it at least this, let rho n be a series of regular B uh, series, a uh, sequence, sorry, sequence of um, regular Borel measures. on K, still assumed to be uh, compact as in the last theorem. Um, and those are supposed which are bounded. So this is um, important because the banach halle theorem over there, maybe I didn't write the name down, so I'm just gonna write it down for you now. Banach, so this is called Banach Ala Oglu, the theorem. And this one is called Ries representation. Just so that you have heard the names. Because those theorems have a, um, like a, a large importance um, completely outside of the CFS theory. Okay, so you have this um, sequence of regular Borel measures and they are bounded. And again, let me tell you that is, so what this means to be bounded here. So what we want is that rho of n of k um, is smaller or equal than some number c. And this statement is to hold for all n in n. Yeah, and so maybe let me just save some space. And it is with C just some real number. Not N dependent, okay. And now the statement of the theorem, so this is the assumption. And basically you know what's coming up, so we know this is basically the setup of the banach uglu theorem. Now what's coming up is then, then there is a convergent subsequence, um, then, there 
um, is a convergence, is a, um, let me write it like this, subsequence, and it's called rho n k, um, with k in n, um, which converges as a measure. which converges as a measure. So what does this mean? So this means the following, this means, and this convergence which I'm writing down is really just this convergence applied to the setting given by this theorem. So here we know that, so the, this convergence just says, well take the linear functional and apply it to the vector. Now in our case the vector is just a function because we have chosen this Banach space and this theorem tells us that application of the linear functional to the function is just the same as integration of the function, right? And so if we just translate this setting, take this convergence in this setting, this is just what, what is meant as convergence as a measure. And if I'm not mistaken, some people call this strong convergence of measures. And um, yeah, so this just means that the limit in this setting right now of k going to infinity. Now I integrate the function f, and this will hold for, maybe I can write it down right now, for all f in z0 of k to r. So and then I integrated this with d rho, and now I'm just writing like one member of the sequence, so we'll have an nk here. And this is just the same thing as sort of putting the limit to the measure, so over k. So this will just be the same thing as the integration over k of the function f with respect to rho. And where I should say, I mean, maybe I should have said this here, so rho and k as k goes to infinity. So this is basically meant what this means, yeah? So this is, this is just translating the weak convergence over here to that setting, apply the linear functional to every point, and this is supposed, this whole thing is supposed to have, uh, to hold point-wise, this means for every function. And this here is basically how we, like this is sort of, so yeah, this is how you write it, if you like. Okay, and just one more statement on the theorem, and I'll have to put it on the next blackboard, but I can tell you already, and furthermore, um, the total volume also converges. So let me write this down over here, and then while I clean the blackboard, we'll talk about what this means, or whether there are questions. This is still part of the theorem, um, and this is not so obvious from what we did before. So if we want to see the part of this last statement, the proof of this last statement, we'll have to look at the book. So moreover, um, the total volume, or the volume, let me just say it like this, the volume also converges. So what this means is just, so the volume is always applying the measure to the whole space, k, okay? And so this is really the same as taking the limit of k going, little k going to infinity of this rho n k and the volume of this. Okay, so that's the end of the theorem. Now while I clean this board, um, you can think about whether there's any questions. Um, and after that, we'll, we'll think about what this means. So are there any questions? Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's true. So the convergence as, me as measure means that it converges for every element of the sigma algebra. It's com this is basically what's already here, yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Sorry? That's coming up. So maybe I can say this already now. So the problem is that K needs to be compact, right? 
So let's just assume if this curly F in the theory of causal fermion system, if this were compact, we would almost be done because we could apply this whole procedure. However, it's not. And this is what we'll, like another half hour, we'll spend another half hour to talk about how to fix this problem. And like, I will explain you just right, like when we go to the next section, I will explain you what you choose as K. And I can already say it, it's the unit ball in F. But I'll write it down in detail and mm -hmm. And, yeah. And so by, oh, yeah. And so one, uh, two things. Um, so first of all, like yesterday, Felix mentioned that the existence theory only works if the measure rho is finite, has finite volume, and if the dimension of the Hilbert space is finite. And you see the first of those ingredients here. So this needs to be bounded, yeah? So this means finite volume. And therefore, this, this shows you the first of those assumptions. And in fact, Felix had a pro uh, pro uh, project um, with um, Franz, for example, to also show existence like without this assumption, right? But it's not, yeah. Ah, okay, I didn't know, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm just saying, yeah. all I wanted to say is that there is, um, so there's research going on to also prove the existence without those two assumptions. But like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, I will, I will say this, yeah. I will say this like uh, in a minute. But so with Franz, did you consider infinite Hilbert spaces or? Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so but in any case, are there any questions so far? not. Okay, so then just some remarks about the, the things we've done so far. So the first thing is, I don't know if anyone is taking notes, but I'll write it down anyway, what I've just said. So, um, so this is just one remark, note. Um, so, um, yeah, boundedness. And the relation to finite volume. So this is the first remark. And the second remark is basically, so if F, so this is like from the theory of causal fermion systems, were compact, we could put K equals to F, yeah? And so then, um, yeah, so then um, how, yeah. So if we do this, so then we like, this would like, so then sort of two would be established. Then two, this was the two in the beginning, would be established. Um, if one showed <coughs> that, I mean, that basically the constraints imply bounded, imply bounded, so this is just like maybe a bit too informal, and limit satisfies constraints. However, F is not compact. <coughs> yeah. 
And this is also important, like just from a physical point of view, to connect to the other lectures, because, um, so I've told you in this construction of those conserved quantities that it's very essential that M is not compact, just from a physical point of view. And M is a closed subset of F, so the only way it can, M can be non-compact is by F being non-compact itself. Okay. Okay, and this leads us to the next section. Um, so maybe I could write it like this. Um, solve this problem by so-called moment measures. And I'll explain this now. Okay, so this is the next section. This is basically, it's called like this. So this is called moment measures. And the idea is really quite simple. The strategy is as follows. Is as follows. Um, restrict the tension or restrict analysis to the following space, 2K. And this is defined now as follows. So what we'll do, we'll just, so this is just a unit ball, yeah? So we take all points in F, and you know F is a space of operators, and the norm we always consider is the supremum norm, and so we'll just take a look at all points in F for which the norm is one. And then we just add zero. Okay? Sorry? Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, the unit sphere, very important. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is the space we consider. And in fact, there is a lemma of Ries. It's not the Ries representation theorem of. And this lemma of Ries basically says that this here, um, where did I write it down? So maybe I should say it like this. The lemma of Ries says that the closed unit ball, norm closed unit ball, of a space is compact if and only if the space is finite dimensional. And so in this case, this means that this is compact if and only if f is finite dimensional. And in our setting where n so on this, I should say, like, and this is the same, or this, like, corresponds in our case to H um, finite dimensional. Because the spin dimension is always finite. And this shows the second assumption, which Felix mentioned, that H is finite, H needs to be finite dimensional. Yeah? The Ries representation theorem, yeah. So F is um, a normed space. So we F is a vector space because it's this set of linear operators. Ah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. It's a subset thereof. Yeah. Okay. I didn't think about this. Felix, would you like to comment?
Yeah. So maybe let me just write like, let's do it like this since I agree this is not really. This is Panahaleoglu theorem, basically for P. So it, yeah, I think it's true, but I'm not sure if it helps. So let me just go on, Felix, if you have something to add about it. You seem to be thinking about it. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. Okay, and so basically, so the idea is um, we want to work with K. And what we'll have to do is we'll have to I'll write it down in a minute. So for a given measure rho on F, we have to define measures on K which sort of carry enough information. So just to give you an, um, like a picture, so this K really, like if we think about, so. Felix always used this picture about f, so he had this, he indicated this fact that like whenever an operator is an f, also its ray is an f. So Felix had this picture here, if you remember from the other lectures. So this would be the set f. And then what we're doing basically is we're basically um, f restricting attention to a subset, so namely to the unit ball in f. So I'm just gonna denote it like this even so. Yeah, so this is like, K now. We are looking at those vectors in F which have norm one together with zero. Um, okay, and again, since H, for, uh, let me put it like this, for H finite dimensional, it follows that K is compact. And that's why we're using right now. And um, just before I tell you a little bit um, more about how to, like, about what I just said, let me just say we need to define um, a sigma algebra on K um, and there's just, it turns out, we need a particular one. So define sigma algebra. On K. By um, just saying that omega is an element of the sigma algebra of K. Let me write it like this. If and only if or if um, the following set, R plus omega, so this is defined as um, just, you take all points in omega, and you just multiply them by all positive numbers. If this is in the sigma algebra, of f, okay? So this is just a technical note, and maybe if it's like, if you're more thinking about the general structures, don't think about this too much. But so the first step of the idea is basically to work with the space k. This is the red subset here. And the second um, step of the idea is then to, how do I put it in words? So for a given measure rho, rho on F, define measures. So a priori you could say a measure, but it turns out you need more. Define measures, and let me just already write down how they're called. So they will be called M0, those are just names. Then there will be an M1, plus, minus, and there will be an M2. And then on K, <coughs> which, if, let me write it like this, from which 
rho can be recovered to a large enough extent. And I'll explain how this works more or less. Enough extent. Okay, so just like um, this is the second part of the idea, um, define measures like this. So again, if we look at this picture, what does it mean? So well, in, generally, in general, we work on this large set F. And so instead of working on this large set, we just work on the smaller set rho, uh, on the smaller red set here, K. And we define measures on K such that from this information contained in those measures, we can reconstruct the original measure to a large enough extent. But now I will explain how this works. And let me just say, and I'll give you some time to copy those measures are called moment measures. And I will now define them. But before doing so, I will give you some time to think about what is happening and whether there are any questions or So basically just for the second part of the talk, Maybe I'll draw a large arrow here, which just indicates that this yellow part is reduced to the red part. So just keep this picture in mind. It's like the central point. So are there any questions so far? Yes? <clears throat> yeah, so I would put it like this. So, I mean, if P is in K, minus P is also in K. And so, yeah. Yeah. But I don't know if there's, Felix, you just tell me whenever you want to add some more. Okay, it's a good answer. Yeah. Uh -huh. Maybe let's, let's just leave it like this for now and yeah. Yeah, so basically that's the claim, and I will not show it here. That is a sigma algebra. Yeah. Okay, and so now let's see how those moment measures are defined. So the first one is really zero. So the first one basically says M zero, now of some omega in the sigma algebra. So maybe I'll write it like this. This omega is an element of the sigma algebra of K. Well, this is just defined as follows. So this is just the row volume of those two sets are plus omega without zero plus the row volume of R minus, uh, sorry, yeah, R, so R minus is just a negative 
if you like, are minus omega without zero. Hope that's clear. Just taking negative lambda over here. This set without zero. Like this? Because there's this, like the zero is what we also had in K. So K was this cap zero. Yeah. Yeah. And so minus is just defined with uh, minus here. And there's one more contribution. Um, plus, I oh know that's it, sorry. Ah, yeah, that's it. Plus, and then we'll write it like this. Omega cap zero. Because there might be a contribution of rho at zero. Okay, and then the other measures, how do they look? Well, they look uh, like this. So we have M1. And first we have an M1 plus of omega. So this is given by one half, and now integration over R plus omega. And now what we have here is the norm of P, and then we integrate this with respect to P, with respect to rho over P. So this is just given the first moment measure one. So just maybe to illustrate this here, like let's assume we have some subset omega here. Let's say this is our subset. And so what this really means, so I integrate, uh, integrate over the whole cone here. And what I integrate, like in order to define the, the, the value of the measure at the sigma, the element of the sigma algebra, is just I integrate the norm of P. So maybe I will write it like this. Okay. And we'll see about how this works on functions in a minute. And then there's um, the same thing basically for minus. So if I put a minus here, I'm just going to put a minus here. And then there's um, finally M is the, like the second, if you like, moment measure, M2 of omega. And this is always like, I define basically the value of the measure on some element of the sigma algebra. So this give, is given as follows. So you'll see like there will be a square here. So this is one half of um, now the integration over R plus omega. P squared, d rho of P, plus, and then the same thing over R minus omega, P squared, d rho of P. Okay. So those are the definition of those moment measures. And what you see is, in fact, that so those moment measures are somehow connected to the homogeneity of a function, and I'll write that down in a minute. But I'll give you some time to, to copy what's on the blackboard. Yeah. And so the next step of the procedure is basically to um, express the action. Question. Yeah. What do you mean? This one and this one. So the thing is like, so the, the omega may, may not be, right? So it could be that I choose the omega here. And then um, it may not be like the omega may just not include minus p. Okay, so the next step would be to express the action and constraints. In terms of moment measures. And as a preparation, I will explain how this works for um, homogeneous functions. And maybe so just to give you the clear picture, so in, um, where, are, where are we right now? So in the section, in the last section, we have to seen how we have seen how existence can be shown if stuff is compact. And now the idea is just like to reformulate the whole setup in this compact way, 
And clearly, you cannot like keep all information. Otherwise, you could just take this as a theory. But it turns out you can keep enough. And now we'll just explain how this works. And also like this, it's not so much more. So we'll just have a little bit more to go. Just to explain how this works with homogeneous functions. OK, so just a recap. <coughs> So a function h recap is a function h h is homogeneous of degree l l and in our case it will be enough that this l is just um, 0, 1, or 2, but it of course holds for others as well, if the following holds. If h, and now I just take some constant mu times x, it's the same thing if I can pull the new outside and I get an L here, mu, h of x. Okay, for example, the absolute value would be homogeneous of degree 1. And it's supposed to hold for all mu in R, and for all x in F, in this case. And the point is that for, th for those functions, we have, if we, and I'm just going to write it down, and afterwards I'm going to explain it. So the point is that if I integrate this function h over F with a measure rho, well, that's just the same thing as integrating the function h over k with respect to the moment measure l. And here the l pops up, and also its degree l and l, just to show where the l is popping up. OK? So how can we understand this? So um, well, basically, the proof, if you want to prove it, um, it follows a homogeneous function, it follows from the fact that a homogeneous function um, is determined uniquely by its restriction to this unit ball we've considered before. Okay, so this is the first step of the proof. The second step of the proof would then just basically, um, so what you can do is you can approximate such a function as usual when you do integration theory by linear combinations of so-called simple functions. And I don't want to state the proof here in detail. You can look it up um, in the book if you like. But the, the thing behind it is basically if I integrate a homogeneous function of a row, I can use exactly this, pull out this real parameter nu, and then it's, um, it is exactly um, corresponds to what I've written here um, in terms of the moment measures. So this means like, so what's this supposed, this is supposed to show you that if I have something which is homogeneous, instead of integrating with respect to rho, I can integrate it with respect to k and this moment measure. And now if you think about, so the point is, maybe I'll write it down. And now it follows, so what we have, so apply, or maybe I'll just write it like this. So the point of this whole thing is the volume is homogeneous of degree zero. Degree zero, okay? <clears throat> the trace constraint, I'll write this down in a minute anyway, trace constraint is homogeneous of degree one. The Lagrangian, and hence also the action, or the, I should say the trace, sorry, the trace. It's a constraint only once I've integrated. The trace is homogeneous of degree one. The Lagrangian, so if you think about the Lagrangian, it was just the absolute value of the operator product. So it's homogeneous of degree two. And similar so for like this, yeah, I just like the integrand of boundedness, integrand 
of boundedness constraints. Okay, and so this explains why we can rewrite then, and I will just now write it down. So. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The function one is homogeneous of degree zero. That's true. So that was a little bit misleading. Okay, and so we have, so if we summarize this, or not summarize, so but apply this, so we'll just have the following. So we basically have, well, so M0 of K needs to be one. This is like corresponds to the volume constraint. And then we have the action of rho can just be written as the integration with respect to k times k. Or maybe let me, I think we always wrote it like this. L, and now I'm just gonna use q and p. And then we have d m2 of p, d m2 of q, um, and then the boundedness constraint, this was T of rho, can be written as the integration over K times K. And then here we have again this absolute value of operators, PQ squared. And then we have DM2 of P, DM2 of Q. And finally, the trace constraint can be written as this, the trace of x p rho with respect to f is just the same thing as the trace of, uh, so this is wrong, this is supposed to be a k, of the trace of p, and then we have dm1 plus of p, um, and the same thing with dm1 minus, it's a minus, okay? And so what this shows, this shows, so in particular, that if rho and rho tilde are two measures on f with the same moment measures, Um, then they also have also have same, and then let me just write it like this, action, trace constraint, and so forth, all of those. Okay, and so the next step is we can now apply this apply the direct method explained in section two. two. Okay, are there any questions up to this point? I think it should be just enough to like. Okay, if not, we'll just um, Basically, the rest of this will be more like an explanation. Okay, so first of all, one can prove, and we find the corresponding proposition in the book, that um, minimizing sequence, that was um, rho k, Um, or for a minimizing sequence, for a minimizing sequence rho k, constraints imply that the moment measures are uniformly bounded. Yeah. And now all of those, m0, 
m1 plus minus and m2 are uniformly bounded. So this is good because this was in one of the assumptions of our theorem. And I'm writing it like this because we don't have the time to like, go through those proof of values I mentioned. Okay, and therefore, thus, results of section two imply that the moment measures um, converge as measures. of subsequence. <coughs> so this means I take the subsequence, I define the corresponding moment measures, so rho m k converge. Okay, so this means basically so this means we have m0 so I'm just gonna put k here, so this is a k. So this is now the moment measures m0 k converges to some m0, m1 k plus minus k converges to some m1 plus minus. In this topology we have considered before, m2 k converges to some M2. So, and yeah. This is coming up. Yeah. And in fact, one can show that the minimum is attained. Okay, this means, so basically it's just, um, yeah. well, this shows that the minimum, minimum is attained. So the minimum here meaning like for this moment measures. Okay, and what remains to show, what remains is the following. One has to show that there is a measure, need to show, that there is a measure rho rho, I mean rho is always on F, which has m1 or m0, m1 plus minus and m2 as moment measures. So this is what you meant with right, the right measure as moment measures. And in fact, it turns out that there's a technical problem. And the way we'll do it in this lecture, due to the time, I will just write down, this is possible, despite the technical problem. <laughs> and I will just tell you that this technical problem, this is called bubbling, or Felix calls this bubbling. And just very, very roughly, it's related to the fact that, um, so if you look at the second moment measure, um, it's possible that, that the measure rho itself goes to zero on one of those sets, but nevertheless, the second moment measure is, does not go to zero. 
And um, the way to deal with this, like maybe I should write it like this. So the way to deal with this is that one actually one modifies the second moment measure M2. And in fact, one makes it smaller. So basically, what one does is one, I mean, there's a way to sort of make it more explicit, the form of this measure, and then you just leave on, you leave away one part which makes the problem. And this is no problem, like making this smaller is no problem because, so you see right here, so we're looking for minimum. So if M2 is smaller, so what makes it smaller means it can be smaller. So you leave out a term, this term could be zero, but it could also be positive, and this term was subtracted. So if M2, so M2 can be smaller, so you see, okay, no problem for the action because the action could be smaller after you left out this term. Well, that's not a problem. We're looking for minimum anyway. The boundedness, boundedness constraint, it's the same story. It could be smaller, but that's not a problem because if you remember the first lecture, the boundedness constraint was not an equality, but an inequality. And last but not least, the trace constraint, which was an equality, and the volume are not affected because they don't involve the M2. So that's how one, one solves this problem. Okay, and yeah. And then maybe I will just write this down, I mean, so therefore, like this, for any M0, M1 plus minus, and M2, so for example, for those which I get in this limit, which I had over there on the other blackboard, but for any, and let me just put a tilde here, this is this modified M2, um, there exists um, a regular Borel measure row which has M1, M, M0, M1 plus minus and M2 tilde as moment measures. Okay. And this just um, now I just need a little bit more space, and then we're done. Let's just give this row a zero here. The row in the statement which I've mentioned here. And therefore, it follows that there exists a minimizer. Why? Because we've shown, we've used the direct method to um, conclude that there exists a minimizer in this formulation in terms of moment measures. And now we've changed those moment measures in a way where we only make the action smaller and the trace constraint smaller and there's a row which has those as moment measures, so in particular, the value for the action and the trace constraint and the boundedness constraint and the volume are the same, and therefore it follows that there exists a measure row or row zero, um, which satisfies the constraints and for which, and with, maybe this, and with, and the action of this measure row is equal to the infimum of all 
rotated. Okay? And this was basically um, what we wanted to show from the very beginning. So this is basically the existence of minimizers. Okay, and that's all I wanted to say. And maybe just a small recap, since this was like, I think in general, quite complicated. So what have we done? Well, so we have first taken a look at the direct method of calculus of variations. Um, we have then, in the part two, um, looked at results from functional an analysis, which have told us how, in general, to apply this direct method um, of the calculus of variations to our setting. We have then realized that there's a problem because some, like the set F is not compact in general. And we have then found a description where we basically can carry, can carry out enough parts of the theory. So that means like we can carry over enough information to a description on a compact space and we were able to conclude or to like use the direct method on this compact space. And the very last step was just to show that um, it is possible then to construct a measure which has the corresponding moment measures. Okay, that's it from my part. Any questions so far? Or, I mean, any questions now that we're done with that topic? <laughs> and if not, let's just go for coffee and um, yeah, you can also ask later if there's questions. Thanks.